Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Steve Poole, one of the CTA pathologists, and uh, this is a, an unknown um, slide session that will cover the three preceding lectures. Um, so this will be somewhat of a review. Um, and the, those three lectures in, were um, soft tissue tumors, so including tumors of blood vessels, fat, uh, muscle and neural tissue. And so we'll look at 10 um, cases today. And the main focus is on the morphology. I won't do too much with the clinical because most of this should be a review from uh, previous lectures, but hopefully this will solidify some of what you saw. And we'll talk about some general points about approaches to tumors in those categories. And um, then I have one exceptional case just from our regular work in the last week that I thought everybody should see. So um, welcome, thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll get started here. Uh, the first case is um, a hobnail hemangioma. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk about the morphology in each of these things first, and then if there are some other features we need to discuss, I'll, I'll do that later. So again, the focus mostly on morphology. So at low power, hobnail hemangiomas are usually raised lesions. So in a shaved biopsy, you're gonna get a good portion of the lesion. And we can see that here, even at low power, there are these large ca cavernous spaces in the superficial dermis. Some of them are filled with red blood cells, so we know that we're in the vascular category. And if we look up at higher power, there are really two elements to the vascular portion of this. Um, this is a classical hobnail hemangioma, so the superficial portion of the lesion shows widely dilated vessels uh, that are close to, but not immediately touching the basement membrane zone. Um, in the papillary dermis. And uh, they have a characteristic pattern to their endothelial cells lining the vascular space, spaces, which is their, um, what I call protuberant. They're sticking out into the lumen and apparently in some ancient manufacture of boots, you attach the soles with nails and the heads stuck out of the soles of the boots and they were referred to as hobnails. So this is recapitulating that appearance. Um, the key features here that in addition to this finding of protuberant endothelial cells is that otherwise the endothelial cells are nice and widely placed. They're not uh, forming any multi-layered structures. Um, they, they are a bit dark, but they aren't particularly enlarged. Uh, they don't have nucleoli, so there's no endothelial nuclear atypia, and there's no endothelial mitoses. Those are all features that you're looking for in an angiosarcoma, and you want them to be absent in a benign lesion like this. So again, the first feature of hobnail hemangioma is widely dilated superficial vessels with protuberant benign endothelial cell nuclei. The second feature is as you go down into the dermis, the vessels become much smaller. They ramify in between normal collagen bundles. And in some places they can appear irregularly branched and even sometimes like they're anastomosing and interconnected. And this, if you took this field alone, it might make some pathologists anxious because ramifying interanastomosing vessels are something you see in angiosarcoma. But again, we, here we have a single layered endothelial layer um, without significant nuclear atypia, multi-layering or mitoses. So even though that architectural pattern is a little bit unusual in the overall context, um, this is a classical finding in hobnail hemangiomas. The other finding, and we'll see if we can see it here, is that there are generally macrophages containing hemosiderin because these things get traumatized and they bleed a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure that's gonna be easy to find. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on that. Usually those are located down 
in the deeper part of the lesion. Um, and I think part of that is these smaller vessels surrounded by collagen are subject to more shear forces. Uh, and um, that's part of what gives this lesion its characteristic clinical appearance. So hobnail hemangioma is a term that was applied to these after they had initially been described as targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma. And I'll show you a picture from the Annals of Dermatology that explains why these are called targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma. So here's the main hemangiomatous lesion in the middle, and then it does have a targetoid appearance. And most of that targetoid area are those small ramifying vessels and hemosiderin and dermal macrophages. So those are the features of hobnail hemangioma. Um, very characteristic if you see it, you'll recognize it instantly, especially if it's got these nice big vessels up near the surface. And um, then uh, clinical features, you can see it at almost any age range. It's got an even sex di distribution, mostly located on the extremities and trunk. And um, the clinical is usually either hemangioma or nevus, which you could see from that clinical picture. Um, and generally ancillary studies are not important for this because it's obvious what it is. And uh, it's the H&E features that help you distinguish it from angiosarcoma. So that's hobnail hemangioma. So now we'll switch over to speaking of angiosarcoma, we'll switch over to angiosarcoma. We'll look at a couple of cases of angiosarcoma, and then we'll talk a little bit about the settings that you can see it in, which are important to have in the back of your mind. So let's see. Okay, so here we've got a shaped biopsy from the scalp. And you can see that it's capturing a nodule. And at low power, we see some irregularly shaped interanastomosing vascular channels. Uh, by contrast to the previous case, we have a number of features that point us towards a malignant diagnosis, those being these endothelial nuclei are very large. Uh, they're, I would say, two or three times the size of what we saw in the hobnail hemangioma. They're very hyperchromatic and they're demonstrating multi layering. So here's a couple that are piled up. Here's a tufted um, cluster. And uh, if we looked around, I'm sure that we could find some mitoses as well. Um, so this is a characteristic pattern of angiosarcoma. And then in some areas here, it has also become more solid. So these are angiosarcoma cells. Um, they're forming some primitive vascular lumina. You can see a few red blood cells in here. And there's another feature here that's quite typical is they, they often have a fairly robust lymphocytic infiltrate sometimes to the point where they can appear to be a lymphoma because the angiosarc is almost completely obscured by the lymphoid infiltrate. Here's our mitoses. So these are all endothelial cells. Um, so we've got all the features to diagnose angiosarcoma, even a small biopsy uh, and without immunohistochemistry. So the key questions here were, are if you don't have these slightly better formed vascular channels and you just have a solid area like this, how do you know this is a vascular tumor? And the answer is you don't. If you just put this field up and said, what is it? It could be an invasive poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. It could be a melanoma. It could be an atypical fibrosanthoma. Um, and 
angiosarcomas in that list of malignancies that make epithelioid cells or large round polygonal cells. You do get a clue sometimes in these in more solid cases where that's all you've got. If you see intracytoplasmic vacuoles containing red blood cells. Uh, but if you don't um, have any clues and it's just a solid sheet of malignant looking cells, then you have to rely on immunohistochemistry. And uh, there are a variety of immunohistochemical stains that will, will stain endothelial cells in an angiosarcoma. Those include factor eight, that's an old, stain that gets used a little bit less now. Um, CD31, which uh, can stain a variety of other tumors as well. So um, it's useful, but it's not 100% specific. Uh, and then the one that we like the most these days is ERG, ERG. Um, and ERG is nice uh, because it's a nuclear stain. So it's very clean. It has a high signal and a low background. Um, it's very specific, and there's always a nice internal control as well with these normal dermal vessels with their endothelial nuclei lighting up. So ERG is a very, very useful tool uh, if you have something that could be an angiosarcoma or you're trying to definitively rule out an angiosarcoma and an otherwise poorly differentiated tumor. Um, so... Um, that's the basics of angiosarcoma histology. I'll show you one case that's um, slightly more subtle. So this is also from the scalp and it's a punch biopsy. And most of what stands out at medium power is a lot of hemorrhage in the dermis. And you might just think this was a bruise, which is sometimes what the clinical of angiosarcoma is. But if you look at slightly higher power, you can see that there's also a lot of nuclei in the background, way too many nuclei for dermal collagen. Um, but they don't really appear to be forming well-defined vascular structures like we saw before. Uh, they are atypi a atypical, so they're enlarged. Some of them have nucleoli. Uh, some of them are clustered. Uh, but this by itself, you might have a hard time saying exactly what this is. Um, it's certainly suspicious for angiosarcoma. You've got um, a lot of unexplained hemorrhage in the dermis with um, cells with atypical nuclei. And so in this instance, the diagnosing pathologist did a CD31, which is one of our other immunostains. And you can see here that the vast majority of those cells, and this is a cytoplasmic stain in contradistinction to ERG. So it stains around the nucleus, but uh, the vast majority of those cells in the background of hemorrhage are positive, and in some places they're even forming clusters and nests. Um, so this is a more subtle example of angiosarcoma. Um, key features of angiosarcoma that you want to have in mind, it um, occurs in very specific clinical settings. Uh, I think Dr. Thompson went over this last week, but and um, there's really four set Four settings. If you're not in one of those settings, um, you need to wonder if you're making the right diagnosis. And having those settings in the back of your mind will prime you to pick it out because since this is an uncommon diagnosis, you don't always think about it. Um, so setting number one, face and scalp of the elderly. Um, so in a, in a background of uh, UV-induced radiation damage, um, setting number two, uh, 
post-radiation therapy in particular um, for breast cancer. And uh, those cases, the vast majority of them are associated with chromosome 8Q24 gains, which corresponds to an amplification of the MYC MYC gene. And uh, in those cases, you can actually do an immunohistochemical stain for MYC to help prove that uh, a vascular lesion in the breast is a post-radiation and angiosarcoma. So that's setting number two. Setting number three is in the background of chronic lymphedema, also known as Stewart-Treves syndrome. Uh, so chronic lymphedema for any reason could be associated with surgery for breast cancer, could be associated with um, congenital lymphedemas, uh, lymphedema of any kind. And then the fourth setting is uh, on the lower limbs of slightly younger patients, not um, associated with sun exposure or radiation. Uh, those are often epithelioid type angiosarcoma, so almost exclusively composed of large round polygonal cells. And um, all of these angiosarcomas have a similar natural history. They all have a terrible prognosis. Um, most of them have some, something like 50% more mortality in the first 15 months after diagnosis, very difficult to treat. Um, and so a really tough diagnosis. Um, so that's angiosarcoma. We'll move on to something which was often seen at the beginning of my career as a pathologist, now much less commonly seen, uh, which is Kaposi's sarcoma. So here we have a punch biopsy, low to medium power. There's a marked increase in cellularity in the dermis that's irregularly distributed. There are some slit-like spaces you can see at low power. There's some more nodular cellular areas. And this is on an acral surface, you can tell. So if we go up to higher power here, we're seeing something that has some similarities to the angiosarcoma we just saw there. There is an interstitial pattern with an increase in uh, spindle cell nuclei, which are at atypical. Um, there's a large number of macrophages containing hemosiderin. And um, then there's also an inflammatory cell infiltrate with lymphocytes and some plasma cells uh, surrounding vessels. And then if we look at this um, pattern in some areas, there are more clear cut vascular lumina like here and here. Um, these are not normal vessels. No normal vessels have that kind of angular irregular pattern. And in some places, the, these um, abnormal vessels are surrounding more normal vessels. Um, this is all very characteristic of Kaposi's sarcoma in its earlier phases. Um, so patch and plaque stage of KS is interanastomosing uh, channels um, with atypical endothelial nuclei, sometimes surrounding more normal structures, either neurovascular or adnexal structures. Here you can see it, uh, these small vessels surrounding a nerve and associated with an inflammatory infiltrate. And then the deeper areas, this is a pattern that you see more in nodular chaos. So this has both early, mid and late stages of chaos. So nodular chaos has more sheets and nests of atypical spindle cells with um, intracytoplasmic 
lumina and some slit-like vascular spaces. And then we'll switch to a different case, which I think is more predominantly nodular. I'll give you a look at that. Sometimes that's all you get. So again, we've got a punch biopsy. You see a tumor in the dermis composed of blue cells. If you look up at higher power, this contains fascicles of cells with nuclei which have granular chromatin. Uh, there are some apoptotic cells with disintegrating nuclei. There are quite a few mitotic figures, like here and here and here, and then. There are slip-like vascular spaces, very poorly formed, containing red blood cells. So this is very characteristic of nodular KS. And, um, and then here, this particular case has an immunohistochemical stain for human herpes virus 8, uh, nuclear stain, which is positive. Um, so this Clinically, must have been an unexpected uh, case of KS and HHV8, as you know, is um, positive in all forms of KS. It's diagnostically very helpful. Um, and uh, so that's the histologic spectrum of KS. And just to review, um, early lesions are thin walled irregular vascular spaces surrounding neurovascular and adnexal structures with lymphocytes and plasma cells. Later lesions are fascicles of spindle cells with slit like spaces. Um, and uh, you can see phagocytose red blood cells within tumor cells, um, which form uh, sometimes characteristic intracytoplasmic hyaline globules, which are PAS positive. Uh, that could be an exam question that it's, I didn't have any of those visible on my case to show you. Um, and then KS, as you probably already know, but as review has also has characteristic clinical settings. So um, there's a pre-1980s patient group, which was well-known elderly men of Mediterranean or Middle Eastern descent. Um, generally with lesions arising on the lower limbs with an indolent behavior. Uh, then there's a central African form, which is endemic and can either have an indolent or aggressive course. Um, then there is a form that occurs in immunosuppressed patients, generally organ transplant patients, um, and that responds to uh, reduction of immunosuppression for tumor management. And then the last is the AIDS-associated form of Kaposi's sarcoma, which was really prevalent um, in the 80s and 90s. So I was a resident from 1995 to 2000. We would see cases of KS every single day, multiple times a day. Um, and now since the advent of heart therapy, uh, you see cases of KS maybe as a dermatopathologist once a month, um, probably less than that. So it's a really interesting disease that was all over the place and now is almost gone. Um, uh, so that's KS. Um, and as I mentioned, HHV8 is associated with all of the different forms. So we'll leave uh, vascular tumors behind. That's three really characteristic vascular tumors to have fixed in your mind. I think any of those are potential um, board questions. And now we're gonna move into some slightly more mundane uh, things, some of which we'll go kind of quickly through. Um, so coming up with uh, 
fatty tumor beyond the lipoma is a bit challenging. Um, and so I'll just briefly show you an angiolipoma. So angiolipoma, low power, similar appearance to lipoma. Um, it's a pale nodule. If you look up at higher power, there's an intermixture of mature adipocytes uh, with their thin cytoplasmic membranes and almost invisible nuclei, and then small capillary sized blood vessels which are generally clustered more towards the periphery of the lesion, as you see here, uh, and then often contain um, intraluminal, sorry, um, vibrant thrombi. Let me find one of those for you. Um, and this, this is part of the thinking of why these things are painful. Um, is that they spontaneously have thrombosis. Um, that's just full of red blood cells. Maybe there was one in here somewhere. Here we go. There's a fibrin thrombus. Nice pink hyalinized uh, structure. Um, Here's some, uh, here's an even better one, layers of red blood cells and fibrin. Um, so not too much to say about angiolipoma um, as, in terms of histologic findings. The interesting part of angiolipoma is that there's a couple things. They might be mostly vessels and very little fat and look like a hemangioma. Um, and unlike all other uh, lipomatous tumors, all of which have cytogenetic abnormalities, angiolipomas have a normal karyotype. Um, so that they're clearly an entity unto themselves. Um, kind of a scientifically interesting thing. Diagnostically, they're very straightforward. So, okay, so we'll move on. We'll leave fatty tumors behind. We'll move into muscle tumors. Okay, so here's a shape biopsy of a raised lesion. And at low to medium power, you can see the slightly brighter dermal collagen is being di displaced by these uh, long fascicles of pale cells that are running in all sorts of different directions. Um, we've got intact solar elastosis up near the surface. And if we look at higher power, these fascicles of cells have some highly characteristic features of smooth muscle cells. So they've got abundant fibrillar pink cytoplasm. Uh, they have some vacuolization, which is often uh, located adjacent to the nucleus. And then they have blunt ended nuclei when they're cut in the right um, plane of section. So that this is a nucleus that you could say was cigar shaped. That's the classical pathologic term terminology, parallel sides and blunt ends um, for a smooth muscle nucleus. And it's also centrally located in the cell. If we look at 
something cut in cross section. You can see that central location really nicely, and you can also see these perinuclear vacuoles really well. Um, these cells have no nuclear atypia. They're not hyperchromatic. They're uniform in size one to another, and they have no mitotic figures. Uh, so this is benign smooth muscle. Um, so this is a pilar leiomyoma. And um, the other key feature with pilar leiomyomas is we talked a lot about the cytology. The architecture is that they, they grow in long, haphazardly arranged fascicles, um, and they're poorly marginated. So it's a little bit hard to draw an exact line of where it ends. They, they extend out into adjacent collagen bundles. Um, and so, um, and they're not encapsulated either, which goes with the poorly marginated part. Um, so pilar leiomyomas can be solitary or multiple. Um, they typically are located on the extensor surface of limbs, on the face and on the trunk. And as a board's question kind of point, they can um, be associated with something called Reed syndrome uh, when they're multiple, which is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion and is associated with uterine myomas and also with renal cell carcinoma. Uh, and this is related to a germline fumarate hydratase mutation. And fumarate hydratase, in addition to being part of the Krebs cycle, is a tumor suppressor gene. So when it's mutated, the tumor suppressor properties go away and uh, these different neoplasms can arise. Um, so something to think about if you have a patient who has multiple uh, leiomyomas. Um, the only other thing to talk about in this instance is um, cutaneous leiomyosarcoma, which is, you'll read about in textbooks, and I imagine that the lecturer who talked about muscle tumors discussed uh, cutaneous leiomyosarcoma has similar growth pattern, but has cytologically atypical cells and mitoses, but it's a, a bit of a misnomer because um, tumors such as this that are limited to the dermis have no metastatic potential and they're cured by a complete excision. So even though histologically they look malignant, they don't behave in a malignant fashion. And uh, there have been some arguments that that terminology should be abandoned for those particular things. They should just be called atypical smooth muscle tumors. and removed to not alarm patients too much. Um, but so the upshot of that is that there are very, very, very few malignant smooth muscle tumors in the skin. If you do see something that is clearly a leiomyosarcoma, the most likely option is that that's a metastatic lesion and not a primary lesion. Um, and that should go through your mind as a pathologist if you're diagnosing. Okay, we'll move on from leiomyoma to a variant smooth muscle tumor. So coming up is angioleiomyoma. And by contrast to pilar leiomyoma, angioleiomyomas are perfectly circumscribed and encapsulated round nodules in the dermis. And as you would expect with their name, they have similar cells to what we described in pilar leiomyoma. They've got abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm with vacuoles, vacuoles adjacent to nuclei. They have blunt-ended or cigar-shaped nuclei, parallel sides, blunt ends. And then they also have a vascular component. So these are all little knots of small vessels. Uh, and then sometimes they have much larger dilated vessels. And the theory is that these arise from the walls of veins and their reduplications of um, 
Venus walls. Um, these are straightforward and easy to diagnose. Um, and so that's about all there is to say about angiomyoma, mostly just a histologic variant. Um, so now we'll leave muscle behind and we'll move into the nerve arena briefly. And we're going to look at our two prototypical neural tumors, neurofibroma and schwannoma, which have some very characteristic differences and some similarities. Uh, so this is a neurofibroma, typical biopsy. It was a pedunculated um, or raised papule. If you look at low power, you see a cellular dermis. Um, with a lot of both pink and blue, which means we've got lots of nuclei and lots of cytoplasm. And if we look up at higher power, these lesions have a very characteristic appearance of delicate spindle cells with tapered nuclei. So in distinction to muscle cells, nerve cells have nuclei that taper down to a fine point. Um, and instead of being uh, parallel sides, the sides also taper towards each other. Um, there's fibrillar cytoplasm with uh, lots of gaps, and um, many of the nuclei are also buckled uh, or wavy. That's a characteristic finding. And then there's typically a background with mast cells. So this is a mast cell. It's got a typical fried egg appearance and granular basophilic cytoplasm. So that's the cytology of neurofibroma. Neurofibromas are also not encapsulated um, or clearly marginated. So this kind of trickles off into normal dermal collagen. And you can't quite tell exactly where it ends. Um, and you don't have to worry too much about malignancy in neurofibromas. Uh, Neurofibrosarcoma, which is now known as malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, is extremely uncommon as a primary lesion in the skin. Um, generally only happens in patients with neurofibromatosis. And there's usually a distinct zonal change where it's arising in a pre-existing neurofibroma. And you see something like what we have here and then something adjacent to it that looks like a straightforward sarcoma with um, marked increase in nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, mitoses, maybe necrosis. Um, so you don't have to spend too much time when you're looking at neurofibroma debating whether it's benign or malignant, um, because there's usually not malignancy hidden in these. Um, so what kind of cells are in a neurofibroma? This is potentially important if you get something and you're not sure that it's a neurofibroma and you decide you want to stain it. So um, neurofibromas have a mixture of Schwann cells, uh, perineural cells, and axons. And what that means in terms of staining, so Schwann cells stain with S100 protein. Um, and so neurofibroma will never be 100% S100 positive. It's generally around 40% or so. Um, perineural cells don't stain with S100, they stain with CD34, which is more of a fibroblast um, marker, and about uh, similar numbers, somewhere less than, slightly less than 50% of cells in neurofibroma stain with a uh, CD34 stain. And 
Um, this is important because occasionally you might see a lesion and you'll say, well, is this a neurofibroma or is this dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans? And that's a reasonable question in some settings if there's a very cellular neurofibroma. And so, and you might do a CD34 stain, CD34 is positive. Uh, but the distinction with that is that neurofibroma also has some S100 positive cells in it, which DFSP doesn't. And neurofibroma has about 40% CV3040 for positivity, uh, whereas DFSP has 100% CV34 positivity. Um, so that's a helpful thing to know about. So that's neurofibroma. Now we'll move on to schwannoma, which has a number of key differences. So dermal schwannomas are uncommon. They do happen, but uh, most schwannomas occur in the subcutis. And you've got an example of that here. Here's uh, excisional specimen uh, with not much in it that was done to access this lesion, which was done deeper. Um, and characteristic of schwannomas, this is perfectly round and encapsulated. It's got a fibrous capsule around it, so it's shelled out um, from adjacent structures. And schwannomas are generally attached to the surface of a nerve um, rather than expanding a pre-existing nerve, which neurofibromas do. Um, so sometimes you can actually find that original nerve um, on the capsule if that was taken with the surgical specimen. And then schwannomas have a uh, characteristic internal architecture that's biphasic. So there are two areas that are known as Antony A and Antony B. So Antony A areas are cellular. Uh, and they're composed of fascicles of spindle cells that line up around less cellular areas, which are known as Viroque bodies. So that's what's happening here. Let me find a better version of that. Um, so yeah, these are nuclei exhibiting palisading adjacent to a nearly acellular region. Uh, so those are Baroque bodies. This, this is an Antony A area. And then Antony B areas are more loose with a lot of space, often with a lot of myxoid material and then bland spindle cells. Um, so those are the two cellular areas. Then schwannomas also very characteristically have perivascular hyalinization, which you can see really nicely here. There's fibrosis adjacent to large vessel. Here's some more. Um, so those are all helpful features. And then uh, schwannomas are composed of 100% schwann cells, which means they stain 100% with S100 protein. And don't stain at all with CD34. There's a good Antony B area with loose mixoid material. Um, uh, so those are the features of schwannoma. Uh, schwannomas can have high cellularity and a high mitotic rate and still be benign. Um, malignant schwannomas are extremely uncommon. Um, so something you won't see very often, but uh, there's our two main neural cell types. And we'll move on to an unusual lesion, which is easy to overlook. Uh, 
So this is a cellular neurofichioma. That's a mouthful to say, cellular neurofichioma. Um, excisional specimen, which demonstrates these large and confluent nests of cells forming a dermal nodule. If you look up at higher power, these nests contain fascicles of spindle cells, which have slightly enlarged but generally bland nuclei and abundant vacuolated and pink cytoplasm. It's a little bit hard to get a sense of what lineage these cells might be because some of them are round. You might think, oh, the, this is melanocytic because it's nested and um, it's got spindled and epithelioid cells. You might think of a spitz nevus. You might think of a fibrohistiocytic tumor, like plexiform fibrohistiocytic tumor. Um, and all of those would be good thoughts. Uh, there's something a little bit different about how this grows than either of those tumors. And um, we'll look at another. So immunohistochemistry is really important for these, but this is a general flavor of uh, nests and fascicles of bland spindled and sometimes epithelioid cells present in the dermis. Um, so we'll switch over to another case that's got some immunohistochemistry. Shape biopsy. This has a slightly different look than the last case. It's much more cellular. Um, it's got uh, more cells with clear cytoplasm. It does have this kind of nested appearance in some areas, um, a fascicular appearance that is storiform in some areas, which might make you think about a fibrohistiocytic tumor. If you took this out of context, that would be pretty decent for dermatofibroma. Um, uh, these other cells, not so much for dermatofibroma. And so cellular neurothechioma is in some ways a diagnosis of exclusion by immunohistochemistry. So you do markers for uh, melanocytes. Um, in this case, a SOX10 was negative. You do epithelial markers, in this case, say P63 was negative. Um, and um, uh, you might do an S100 stain, which would be negative. A muscle stain, Desmond, in this case, was negative. Um, and then there's one stain that's positive in cellular neurothechioma that's generally negative in other things in the differential diagnosis, that's NKIC3. Uh, that could be a board question. So here's an NKIC3, which strongly and diffusely stains um, the tumor cells. So that's cellular neurothechioma. Um, this occurs predominantly in younger patients. Um, and it's, as we said, a multilobular cellular tumor with a fibrous stroma uh, can look histiocytic or melanocytic, negative for melanocytic markers like S100 and SOX10, positive with NKIC3. So that really covers our review of, uh, that's nine great soft tissue cases. And then I'm gonna show you something that you could classify as a soft tissue tumor um, as well. It's, out of classification in some ways. Um, very, very uncommon. And I'd encourage, I'm not gonna give you the diagnosis up front on this one, I'll walk you through the findings. So any of the derm path mavens in the group, if you can get your mind in gear and see if you know what this is, that would be great.
And once you've seen it, you'll instantly recognize it the next time you see it, which probably won't be for a while. But so this was a forearm biopsy from a middle-aged patient. And you can see there's a dermal nodule. It's got variable cellularity and looks like a variety of cell types. There are clusters of small dark cells that look like they might be lymphocytes and then sheets of much larger cells with abundant pale cytoplasm at low power. And it's a pretty circumscribed small nodule. Um, we look up at higher power. The darker areas are indeed mostly small lymphocytes. Um, there's a smattering of plasma cells in here in some places. And uh, there are also quite a number of neutrophils. Here's a bunch of trilobed uh, cells. Um, here's a plasma cell here. The further we look, we'll find clusters of plasma cells. So the darker areas are, are sheets of inflammatory cells. The lighter areas are these very large epithelioid cells with large nuclei and just enormous amounts of cytoplasm. And in some places, these large cells also appear to have neutrophils right next to them. Uh, in some places, they have neutrophils that appear to be within them, like right here, um, and here, and here, which is a very unusual finding. In some places, they've got plasma cells within them. These are both plasma cells with cogwheel nuclei and perinuclear clearing. Uh, so a reasonable guess is that these larger cells are in the histiocytic family somehow. They've got vacuolated cytoplasm, pale cytoplasm, large but bland nuclei. Uh, so a nodular circumscribed lesion with a mixture of a dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and sheets of large epithelioid histiocytes um, is suspicious for a particular disease called Rosai Dorfman disease. If any of you got that, congratulations. And the way to prove that this is Rosai Dorfman disease, in addition to the findings I just described, is to do an S100 stain. So, um, and S100 labels the histiocytes in Rosai Dorfman disease. Uh, and sometimes you can, you can see the inflammatory cells um, within the cytoplasm of these S100 positive histiocytes. Um, so, um, so this is Rosai Dorfman disease, uh, very unusual um, disease tumor, if you will, in the category of the histiocytoses. Um, we described all the findings. There's one finding that has a special name and that is these areas where the large histiocytic cells have inflammatory cells in their cytoplasm. Uh, it's actually not in their cytoplasm. The cells are passing through their cytoplasm using a process known as empiripolysis. Um, and empiripolysis is something that's virtually unique to this disease. Um, and somehow these inflammatory cells are migrating through the histiocytes without actually entering the histiocytes. So they're, these spaces, they're, they're still extracellular. Um, so in Rosai Dorfman disease, the important part of cutaneous Rosai Dorfman disease is first to recognize them and um, and then to know that Rosé Dorfman disease is, um, has a systemic form uh, that is generally found in lymph nodes. In the systemic form, um, it may be limited to lymph nodes or have uh, extranodal involvement in about 40% of cases. And in those cases with extranodal involvement, the skin is the most common site. And so anytime you see cutaneous Rosai Dorfman disease, the patient needs to go 
have an evaluation to see if they have nodal Rosa Dorfman disease. Um, and uh, isolated uh, cutaneous Rosa Dorfman disease is extremely rare. It's the, probably on the order of 30 or 40 reported cases in the world now. Um, and it's unclear exactly what the etiology of this is um, or what the significance of isolated cutaneous Rosa Dorfman disease is also. Um, so it's a, it's a real oddity, um, it's kind of a fascinating process. And uh, that's a good place to stop. I hope this has been helpful for everybody. Um, these are 10 great soft tissue cases. And hopefully you've got a clear picture of some of the things you've got in your lectures from the last couple of weeks. Um, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you the next time.